Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Pentecost with APA Virginia staff. Thanks for joining us for our monthly webinar series, Your Hour with APA Virginia, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. Hopefully everyone had a good Thanksgiving and thanks for giving us some of your time today on your lunch hour, hopefully. Um, there's one CM credit available for today's webinar for watching it live. So if you're watching this recording in the future, you cannot earn a CM credit, unfortunately. But if you're watching live today, you can find the CM information on virginia.planning.org or look out for the follow-up email after this webinar. I have a couple announcements from the chapters you can see here on your screen, hopefully. Let's see. Yes. Our annual conference is coming up in Hampton, Virginia this year at the Convention Center. It's July 21st through the 24th, and the request for proposals is now open. So we welcome everyone to submit sessions. You don't have to be a member of the chapter. You don't have to be a member of APA. Um, so we encourage people from all over to submit proposals. The theme this year is resilience. And the call for proposals is open until January 25th. And you can find that at virginia.planning.org. Sponsorship info and a very cool logo are coming soon. So be on the lookout for that. Be sure that if you're an APA Virginia member that you're reading your newsletter. That comes every couple weeks. And that will keep you updated on all the information about the conference, job opportunities, upcoming events, CM opportunities upcoming board meetings and just keeps you updated on what the chapter has been up to <clears throat> and for those that just signed on thank you again for joining us for today's webinar your hour with APA Virginia sponsored by the Berkeley group shout out to the Berkeley group thank you for making this happen and thank you to everyone who shares this with your colleagues and helps spread the word our webinars are the fourth Monday of each month from noon to 1 p.m covering many topics in the planning field. Um, <clears throat> next month, we will have folks from the city of Alexandria highlighting their new park partnership program and efforts to revamp their local parks. That will be December 17th, the third Monday in December because of Christmas. So check out virginia.planning.org to sign up for that. Today, we have Dale Neef, presenting on how to prepare your small towns for autonomous vehicles because they are coming. Dale Neef lives in Loudoun County, Virginia, and is an author and strategic technology consultant who advises organizations and communities on digital economy issues. He's been a technical consultant for the Asian Development Bank, worked for IBM and Community Computer Sciences Corp. He was a fellow at Ernst & Young's Center for Business Innovation. He's a member of the American Planning Association's Smart Cities Task Force and is on the International City County Management Association's Digital Strategies Advisory Board. He earned his doctorate from Cambridge University and has written or edited eight books on technology and society. So Dale, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much. Let me just pull up my screen here. Still not getting a screen, Sarah. How's that look? Um, yes, just go ahead and pull up your presentation. Do you need me to bring it back to my screen for a second? Yeah, I think so. It's not pulling up for some reason. It's just okay. turning. All right. Sorry about that, guys. I'm just going to put this on hold for a second. All righty. Um, Dale, can you pull up your presentation, like PowerPoint or PDF format? Do you want me to do it on my own, uh, mm -hmm. or um, uh, is it supposed to be loaded? 
Yes, you'll present from your computer screen. Okay, hang on just a second. Can you see that? Um, okay, let me give it back to you now. Okay. Is that better? We are good to go. Okay, that's great. Hello, everybody. Um, what? <laughs> starting a bit late on that. Sorry about the technical problems. The um, what I wanted to do today was bring perspective on um, autonomous vehicle development and what it means specifically to planners and city managers, um, and not just to big cities, because most of the cities are already working on this quite extensively, but looking at sort of the satellite cities, so the smaller cities around the large metropolitan areas, and also some small towns, and even uh, the rural communities and counties, um, because a lot of the responsibility for these things over the next 10 to 15 years tend, I suspect, to be down at the county level or multiple towns working together if uh, they're going to be something outside of the sort of uh, urban areas where most things are going on right now. Um, many of you are probably already following what the APA is doing on this because uh, David Rouse, you'll probably know at the APA Research and Advisory Group at National here in DC, um, they have the smart cities task force, which I'm on, but an element, an important element of all of the smart cities aspect these days is autonomous vehicles. They've got a nice research knowledge base collection, which if you haven't looked at and you're interested in the AV side of things, you, you probably want to have a, a glance at. Um, today, I, I think one of the problem is um, I've been going to a lot of these commercial conferences that focus primarily on autonomous vehicles and smart cities because the idea is that density and urbanization that's occurring um, means that, and the money and the number of planners who are involved means that most cities are already looking quite extensively at this. But I'm finding a lot of planners and city managers who are attending and sort of busting their education budget going up to commercial conferences and the problem they're finding is that they can't really get the proper perspective because these conferences are often not terribly relevant to towns because they're trying to talk to suppliers or investors and so their focus is different and it's often very disjointed and so what we've done is put together a full day's um, education uh, seminar um, for connected and autonomous vehicles we call it cab 101 um, just for small municipalities and counties because um, they, in some ways they're being sort of left out of the situation uh, by not only the automotive manufacturers but by uh, sort of in many ways the press as well. We're going to actually be kicking that off in Phoenix with a big AV seminar um, at uh, Arizona State University um, early next year. But what we might think about doing is something here in Virginia, because if you think nationally what's happening is, in Detroit you have the automakers, and it's almost a Marshall Plan for Detroit. They are throwing so much money at this, both Ford and General Motors, but all of the others have sort of moved up and traditionally been around there that are associated with the auto manufacturing side of things. This is what they're going to be doing for the rest of any of our lives. Um, and then, of course, you have Silicon Valley, and this is part of what we'll be talking about today. So you've got Detroit as a major center of automotive manufacturing. You've got Silicon Valley, who plunged into this in many ways before the auto manufacturers did, with Google, who made Waymo, and um, even Apple is in this in a big way. Again, we'll look at all of this. Um, and then what is interesting is Phoenix is becoming sort of the test bed for the nation. And there, Arizona is throwing huge amounts of money at this um, because the characteristics of the, the climate and the roads and the markings are all much easier to read there for testing. But I suspect like Amazon, they want to have, everybody wants to have an East Coast representation. And I think part of, in fact, if you think of Amazon, 
coming to New York and Crystal City. I think part of that is also because they want to start testing, particularly their delivery systems. I think that's why Amazon bought Whole Foods in part, was to start delivering to the home. And I suspect we'll be finding very rapidly that, that both in Crystal City and in New York, they'll start launching some of their, uh, their test pilots for um, various uh, shuttles and home delivery. Um, Virginia itself is doing quite a lot in this area. The state has, you probably already know, they have an autonomous system center of excellence, and they're doing, we've got smart roads looping around the, the DC area. You've got I-66 and 495, 95. I think in fact 50 and maybe even 29 are involved with all of that. But again, a lot of this work is going to be done at the county level just because of the governance and, and side of things. So a lot of that will involve Fairfax County, and they're sort of becoming the test track for Virginia because of all those roads. But you also, I mean, we've got Virginia Tech Transportation Institute down there in Blacksburg. Um, they're sort of becoming known globally. Um, and they have that Virginia Smart Road, which is the two and a half miles of uh, testing roadway down in Montgomery County. And then Loudoun County is starting to think about a lot of this. I've been speaking with uh, Swanka Burnett, who's with the EDC up here, and they've got some interesting ideas about autonomous shuttle testing. So there are a lot of things that we could do close to home. In fact, maybe what we ought to do at some point is a seminar here. But let me, let me show you then. Let's plunge into it. Um, Let me just reduce this so I can see. So what we're talking about, the takeaways for today is, the AV economy is not just about self-driving cars. So the problem we have is, most people only read, um, most of your constituents will only read about AV autonomous vehicles in the sense of, I don't know, maybe a Tesla crash, or it's usually a crash. Or, or the pedestrian being um, killed in Chandler from Uber. And they're sort of thinking of it in those terms. But what is happening is something much, much larger. And it's not just about self-driving cars. And it's certainly not about individually owned self-driving cars. So what is really happening is something that's a fundamental change in terms of the technology that has changed over the last decade. Uh, how that is tied to the economy. and the alterations it's making in transportation, which will be permanent. And it's also happening all around the world. And is, as we'll explore, it's, it's almost every major digital economy company. So this is not just Ford, and it's not just General Motors or Volvo. This is almost every company that's involved in sort of the digital economy. We'll look at all of this in the next sort of model. Um, and the importance to all of this is that it's connectivity, because it's all based on data and connectivity to the cloud. And this worries me to a large extent, because so many small town and rural areas, as we all know, for the last 15 or 20 years, have been fairly excluded from the gigabit economy, because they tend to not have the rural high-speed broadband. And without broadband, you don't have the connectivity. So we're going to have to look at fiber. And I think I've seen some enormous changes even at the FCC and such, but also I suspect with the infrastructure proposals coming up in DC, they're gonna start saying, actually, we really do need to get some fiber out to the rural communities and the counties, or we're going to be having problems with connectivity and therefore we'll have a sort of two-tier economy where the cities have autonomous vehicles and they stop at the big city line. So we'll be talking a bit about that. But all of that means that there are preparations that you can be doing, even if you're a county, a rural county, or a small town, or a satellite town or city around one of the larger metropolitan areas, to things that you can be doing right now to become more AV friendly. So these are the things we'll be talking about, the transformational side of things, how it ties into a, a whole trend that's occurring in the economy worldwide, how that's changing transportation. We'll do a little bit about 
a discussion about AV technologies and, 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 and finding out that it's not just about cars, it's about many other different types of AV technologies. And then we'll look at the implications for towns and counties and what we can be doing to become more AV friendly. So let's start with big data, which of course everybody hears all about these days. And yes, it's, it's a massive amount of data collection and it's happening, I've been working in it for about 10 years now and I'm still shocked with the amount of data that's being collected. In, in the industrial world, it's because sensors are changing and you're seeing it happening in the automotive, but in almost every uh, manufacturing area where you have tracking procedures, but almost anything that, is, uh, that creates heat or, uh, or spins or has pressure or can be located or creates text or a video, all of that is being collected. From that data, they get a number of things. It is possible both scientifically and medically to use them, that data for complex trend analysis. And it's integral to the very concept of the AI and machine learning that is necessary for automobiles to learn not to run into um, one lane bridges and, um, and pedestrians and those types of things. So that machine learning is a, a crucial aspect to AV. And of course, at the heart of it all, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, is targeted advertising because they're collecting that data on everything we do from going to the store to where we're heading um, uh, when we drive a car. They're collecting that and that data can be used, can be monetized so that people can sell advertising to you um, to attract you to different areas in, in retail and so forth. So it, big data is not just the massive collection, it is the, the, the interest behind it tends to be the trend analysis, the machine learning, and also the targeted advertising, and that's why it's so important. Online shopping and the Internet of Things, we've been hearing about for a long time, at least for 20 years, but in fact, it's, it's really coming into its own now. And if you look at some of these charts on the right here, you can see, and we've all seen it with, I mean, when you've got Sears, collapsing into bankruptcy, what, what we're finding is that in fact, it's moving very rapidly toward everything being ordered online. And so they're restructuring the very nature of retail outlets so that you might only go there to look at an item and then the idea is that you order through their store. So there's a lot of scrambling for um, an, uh, uh, infrastructure changes around all of this. The, uh, the smart TV is going to add to that, the wearables, the connected home, each of those are, are small in a sense. You can sort of see them on the right, but you put them all together and it starts really adding up. And in terms of internet traffic and therefore data production and therefore demand on connectivity, you see all of those shooting up. I stopped most of those graphs in 2018, but it's, it's really skyrocketing. And as you can see, it's not just in the United States, if you look up there by geography, the, the blue and yellow one, it's around the world. And all of that data has to go somewhere and where it's going is into the cloud because data storage now is just everything. And especially if you're up here in Loudoun, you can appreciate that because they're, they're throwing up data centers here uh, the size of Home Depot sort of every three months. Um, it's enormous amount of data being stored and they're using the same technologies that Amazon and Google developed initially for their search infrastructure. And therefore they, they want to have huge numbers of, um, of computer centers to hold all of that data, to also process that data. But the most important aspect of this, other than the fact that infrastructure wise, we've got huge amounts of data being stored is that they've shifted to a pay-as-you-go service offering, which at a local municipality you may also appreciate, but it's certainly true among businesses. When I started at IBM, everybody had a mainframe and a data center, and you had a whole crew of data management personnel. Most of that is going away because what all of these companies offer and what they want you to subscribe to is pay-as-you-go services. So everything from software as service, so almost any application from uh, human resources to marketing to the data management itself, 
all can be done online. And so what they want you to do is all your data goes into the cloud and then they will provide you services. And, and in the meantime, they get to look at a lot of that data. And so it's the scraping of every email that you have that, for example, uh, many of the, the email services use, they'll, they'll look at your, what you purchase online, they'll scrape your emails for uh, specific wording, and all of that data is collected to set a profile on you, and then that can be sold, and then companies will advertise to you. And that is the nature of things, and that's the pay-as-you-go system, and there's a lot of money in it and a lot of interest in it from these types of companies. So certainly it would be Google and Facebook, Amazon. They're right in the middle of that, and behind them, the infrastructure side of things would be the sort of Cisco and Microsoft and Intel. Telecoms also want to get in on this because they have the content side of things and they want to get into the home television side of things or the, uh, the home IoT side of things where they work through your telephone or your television. Um, and as we'll see, they also want to get involved with the connectivity for autonomous vehicles. So you see a lot of the big telecoms companies really pushing into this area. And of course, you've got the online retail from Amazon and Walmart, Alibaba, which is the sort of Chinese equivalent of Amazon. And you've got all the data focused advertising that, that surrounds that. Again, it initially came from the sort of big Google, Amazon, and Facebook type of servers and the algorithms that they use. But now they're applying that to anything they can for service on demand type of uh, services. And that is because that's where the money is. Um, that's where the earnings are. That's where the valuations, these are the largest uh, or the highest valued companies in the world. That's where the jobs are. In fact, I was just reading that um, General Motors is saying that they're, um, they're going to buy out employees with 12 or more years of company, which is about 18,000 of its 50,000 salaried staff in the United States. They're going to buy them out because they're pushing toward um, young professionals with uh, data technology um, capabilities. And this is where the world is moving. You can see these are the groups that are driving all of that. And then we come on to autonomous vehicles. And if you think about it, that's because it's very natural we should be doing that in autonomous vehicles. They're, they're a combination of all the things we've been talking about. Huge data production. Um, so it's not only for the safety side of things, but for the marketable side of data that you can collect from drivers and riders about where they're going, what their interests are. It's driving it into the edge and cloud. So all of this data has to go somewhere. It's not going to be collected in the car any more than it is in your um, smartphone. They want to drive both the most of the computerization and most of the data collection and analysis out of that out of your actual smartphone or out of your car and into the cloud because they want to own that data, they want to analyze that data, and because it just makes practical sense that that sort of level of data exchange has to be done on a broader basis and that you have to get it into the cloud and the servers, and that means you've got to get it out of the car. So although we think of them as very intelligent the cars, in fact, most of that data and the data management side of it soon will be done through infrastructure that surrounds the car. And you can see where I'm going with, with that because that's what, in part, you will oversee and possibly own as a municipality. And what they're really selling you is exactly what all the others are, which is an entire digitally connected system. So it's a driving system, but it's really smartphones on wheels. The idea is at some point, and it's not too far in the future, this is what everyone's driving toward, You'll have your smartphone, it will be connected, to, and all of your IT will all be through the cloud, through applications that you access through the cloud. That will come into your car, you'll swipe it, you'll get in the car, it'll, it'll become essentially your extension of your home, and that will take you into your business. Um, and so what they want to do is have that almost seamless. And in part, that comes because they want to advertise to you. And as you become autonomous and you have much more time and you're reading the newspaper or you're flipping through the screens while you're going someplace, 
they're looking at sort of six hours a week as a potential market per person to capture that data on people of what they're interested in and where they're going and then to advertise them is an enormous market. So again, if you look at it, I mean, transportation was sort of lagging behind because it's obviously the next logical area of focus for all of this because it affects all of us. It's a huge proportion of our individual family and government expenditures. Um, it's happening globally, so all of these companies can expand whatever service they have here all around the world. And it's largely been left out of the digital revolution. If you think about it, we're, we're looking at automobiles that are not so different than they were in 1960 or 1920, for that matter. You still get your steering wheel and you just drive the car. And it hasn't been following along with the digital revolution at the level that it, it possibly could have been. It can also be modeled on this pay-as-you-go service offering. And if you look over to the left there, you can see this is what they're going for. If you think normally you sell a car, you might get some revenue coming back to your maintenance and a dealership, which is if you look at the, the sort of either at the top or the bottom, the, the base, the green at the bottom or the top chart, it's the darker blue. That's your base of what you're expecting to get back. Um, through other services after you've sold the car. But what they're thinking of is what they really want to do is get the current data enabled services. So all of the things that you would get in terms of advertising or that you would get in terms of the data itself or the fees associated with all of that gives them an aftermarket share which is much, much higher. And you can see what they're planning on at the bottom one on the left because by 2025 or even 2030, they're looking at the, the actual sale of the car doesn't make that much difference. What they're looking at is the after sales services, which come through something which will be called probably autonomous mobility in the cloud. We'll look at all, uh, all of that in a second. So it's that aftermarket share they're looking at. And it's, it's really the same usual suspects because all of the big data companies and all of the IoT and cloud companies want a piece of this. And if you look at that list, it's the same list that's been very successful over the last decade. And everybody who's involved with the IoT, so the Internet of Things, is now pushing. And in some ways, they were the ones who pushed the automotive industry into autonomous vehicles. And now the, autom or the uh, automotive manufacturers like Ford and GM and Volvo and Toyota are saying, yeah, we want that. We want to be part of big data. We want to be part of the cloud. We want to be part of the IoT action. And we want some money from that in your same model that you're playing, uh, rather than just selling cars and picking up some money on maintenance. And in some ways, uh, it's interesting because this is unique as an industry, this is supply-driven, not demand-driven. There aren't too many of us who are really desperate to have autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, we might like them. It's an interesting idea. But we're not saying, I can't live without it. Where, you know, so it's sort of like the smartphone. They dangle it in front of you. And then once you start using it, you begin to say, well, that works pretty well. So the point is, in fact, this is going to happen whether, <laughs> whether we want it to or not because it is obviously what needs to happen in transportation and the automotive industry to catch up and make the sort of money that they need to um, in this new digital economy. And so that's what's happened. Transportation has finally been added to the digital economy and that all of these different groups involved in it and they all want it to work. So we normally think, oh, it's in fact, it's quite nice this is more what we're looking at. So we normally think, well, Uncle Bob is going to buy a Tesla with some advanced collision side of things. That's not what this is about. Autonomous vehicles is about all of these groups wanting to make as much money as they can, and they're driving it. And so when I go to these conferences, the, the amount of technology and money being spent is just absolutely enormous. And this is understood to be the future of, of, of vehicles. Um, but 
we, we don't really read that in the press, not the urgency nor the magnitude of it all. Part of it is because they're, they're playing their cards fairly close to their chest because they don't really know how to begin all of this. But at this point, they were also scrambling. So it's early days, but they're scrambling for alliances because no single group actually can do any of this on their own. So you, Ford knows how to put together cars and they know how to do a massive production side of things, but they don't really know that much about software or communications or infotainment. And so Silicon Valley knows a lot about software. So you had Apple, for example, at the very beginning uh, pushing this, and they're not sure that they can do the auto production, same as Tesla, in fact. So you've got all these different groups right now vying for collaborative position. Uh, sometimes overlapping, sometimes um, making individual contracts with each other. And so that's where we are right now. Everybody's scrambling for those alliances. And a lot of that is also going overseas because Ford wants to sell Fords everywhere in the world. Um, and also because China is moving very rapidly in this area, as is, for example, Singapore and in fact, if you look at the two graphs on your right there, you'll notice, yeah, I mean, we always think of America because we drive cars and that's the way we live. But in fact, they're, they're not hugely, in fact, they're looking by 2035, falling behind China in terms of the number of autonomous vehicles. But, you know, so the U.S. is a big player in it, obviously, but it's something that's happening worldwide. And if you look at Western Europe, I just got back from uh, Britain yesterday, they're doing a huge amount, as, as most of Europe is, into looking into it, partly because they want to tie it into the public transportation system. So they're not necessarily looking at about uh, individual owners of any of this. But you can see there's sort of a, a global um, expansion in this area. And the, then the question is, in terms of a global alliance, how are the companies going to align themselves? So I guess the point is, all of this is happening to some extent under our noses, because unless you really follow this, uh, you know, you get the occasional article, but you don't realize how much money is behind all of this. And if you look, General Motors, for example, um, the work that they've just uh, closed with SoftBank and Honda, that's a lot of money. And uh, Volkswagen, uh, this yesterday said instead of the 48 billion, which I have here by 2025, they've raised it to 50 billion by 2023. So they've, they've raised um, how, um, what they think they will budget for it. Um, you can see the Ford, and you can look at almost any one of these collaborative groups, and they're looking at spending huge amounts of serious money. Um, and they're not doing all of this to sell to individuals which I guess is a very important point. The ind individual consumer ownership will probably, at least initially, be a very small amount of it because it potentially, at the very beginning, it's gonna be a very expensive car, 250 to $300,000. So it's almost a luxury market. So the real focus that they're all looking at is fleets because what they want to do and is look at, so it's, it's things like Uber, it's doing what Uber is doing now, fleets of autonomous vehicles that are owned by various groups. And everyone is scrambling to align themselves with some of those, uh, those sharing groups right now. So you've got, if you look at the screen, you've got Uber and Lyft and Waymo. And everybody is trying to get involved with that or create it themselves because they realize that it's going to be fleets of these autonomous cars rather than individual ownership possibly shared, but certainly fleets, um, that will make money at the beginning. And the question is, who owns those fleets? Well, you can be the auto manufacturers themselves. Um, the logistics companies are really rallying to this, so UPS or um, any of the others, um, FedEx. Um, you've got the rental groups looking at it in a big way. You've got the software groups like Waymo, which is Alphabet, which is Google. You've got the retail side of things who want to, I mean, that's probably why Walmart bought Whole Foods, whether they're starting toward home deliveries. And so, I mean, Amazon bought Whole Foods. They're, they're trying to uh, sell it uh, at the home. And so
so they want to own the delivery vehicles that will go around the neighborhoods and you can take your phone out and, and swipe it and pick up your own groceries. Uh, and then, of course, institutions can do this. So what you see is large hospitals doing it so they can ferry people back and forth and they can avoid the uh, ambulance fees. Um, you see educational institutions like universities doing it on their campuses where they have shuttles that are, are self-driving. They're already doing this in a number of universities. And then it can just be private institutions like a large corporation that may want to do it and, and shuttle back and forth to a metro station. Or, and this is where we all come into it, it can also be municipalities and transit agencies. Municipalities may want to own, at least in part, the fleet that then become part of the, the, the general public transit side of things. We'll look at this in a couple of other slides. When's it gonna happen? Nobody knows. I put this up because I, I always think this is an interesting photo. You see it at every conference, but I guess it, it's making the point that when we think about technology, sometimes it happens a lot faster than we, we realize. And so on the left, if you're looking at all the horses, the, the idea is spot the one automobile that you see down there. And then 13 years later on the same street, I suppose there's a horse there somewhere. Um, but that was 13 years. And I think that's about where we're looking at here. We're looking about between 30 and 35, starting to make that tipping point where everything then becomes autonomous and we're into a whole different world. Uh, an interesting sentence at the bottom about the 1980s predictions that by 2000, there'd be almost a million cell phones. And of course there are 109 million and they're worldwide. And most of them are smartphones, which is a completely different capacity and a completely different economic model than anyone ever imagined. Most of the time when you look at the levels, they'll give you these sorts of things. So you're, you're running one or zero to five, and I just got an outback, which is sort of at two. Um, so it has the, the sort of collision avoidance and the lane warnings and things like that, but you're still holding on to it. Um, there's some question whether three will, be, people may just, the manufacturers may skip over three and go to the four and five because it's a very distracting thing if you have to be partially monitoring your car the whole time, because then you, you're neither one nor the other, and they're worried about all sorts of accidents that could happen with that. So when it happens, I don't know. I would say it's sort of, the, the, if you look at some of the estimates that we have here, um, by 2035, Navigant says 75% of all passenger vehicles bought will be self-driving, and I think they mean fleets with that as well. And 75% of traffic, certainly by 2040, will be autonomous vehicles. So when it actually breaks that 50%, mm, sort of 2030 to 2035. But of course, that depends on if we're talking about the fully autonomous but mixed, so that would be more the individual car that you would buy that Uncle Bob would buy, and he would be able to drive it, um, whether it was on fully autonomous or if he just wanted to drive it without that as a normal car. What's interesting, I noticed General Motors um, was just announcing that uh, they are trying to um, set up a system where with the autonomous cars, once you buy them, if you're not using it at work, you just essentially rent it back to them. And they use it for the day to go around and pick up passengers as they would if you were an Uber driver. But that's being done while you're at work or at home and don't need the car. And then they get a percentage from that and you get a percentage from that. So it's a shared vehicle, sort of shared autonomous vehicle sort of model that allows them to get into the fleet side of things as well. So there's all sorts of, of machinations around it. And it depends on whether you're in an urban environment or an open road environment or if you're in a sort of congested town where there are a lot of pedestrian crossings or complexity. And so it, it's not going to be uniformly, but we can tell that it's happening in these sort of phases. And really between, well, 2025, which is only seven years away, and, and 2030 is probably when you, you really become into robotic driving universally. And the reason, of course, that matters to us, this is quite an interesting one. This seems to find the same thing. It's really in that phase three between 2027 and 2040. 
when things really, that's where the tipping point is, where you get a total autonomous conversion. But if you think, I mean, 2027 is 10 years away. So in terms of planning and infrastructure and policy changes, it's time to get cracking on it. Um, particularly if you need to develop comp plans in 2020 for the next five to 10 years, this is the sort of time that you need to be thinking or at least developing the concepts. Um, and we'll talk about that, which is the whole point of all of this. One other thing, it's also important to remember that the autonomous vehicle is not just about cars. Uh, trucks are likely to really lead cars in the sense that you've got a lot of these truck platooning, so the market leaders that we've got listed there on the left, all of those, they're ready for it because there's not too much that's too complex about it. The platooning aspect is they all fall in line and they essentially take up a, 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 a caravan, a train load of them as they go up one lane. Um, that can already be done and it's being tested, if you look on the right, it's being tested quite a lot on the European side, and in fact, they're saying the market with the highest growth rate um, for the next decade is really Europe. And I've noticed that over there because um, most fatalities occur around trucks, and they're putting a huge emphasis. Most of the nations are smaller, so it's a lot easier. Um, so the question is, who owns those? Obviously, the same transport companies that own them now. But also you got you have groups like DHL and UPS, which just reordered 125 of Tesla's self-driving long-haul tractor trailers. So that's an area that actually is going to boom quite rapidly. Uh, delivery is going to be huge. I suspect. I mean, you have everybody from FedEx to the grocery stores themselves to Amazon and Walmart. They're all doing a deal because they want to take advantage of the Internet of Things and they want to be able to deliver at home. Um, so you, if you look around, you'll see there's a lot of that going on. Robo-taxis will probably be a huge part of it um, rather than individual ownership um, because it's the first mile, last mile that is so difficult. And if you look down at that driverless taxi ecosystem, you can see, again, all of the big groups are moving toward trying to develop the driverless taxi side of things. And of course, there's buses and public transport. And part of what we've seen is that the ride hailing companies like Uber and Lyft have so undermined the use of public services, of public transportation, that UC Davis did a study last month that, that came up and 61% of people choose to use right hailing or public transit. And if you look on the right, the graph, you can see from 16, second quarter 16, how dramatically the decline is becoming transportation usage. And so the question is, can you make that better? Because it doesn't mean that people don't need it um, or that people can necessarily afford to use right hailing. And so if you're providing public transit as a public policy, it's, it's going to be something that the buses side of things is going to be something as probably the robo-taxi is going to be very important to municipalities themselves because it's that, that first mile, last mile synchronization. There is another aspect to all of this, which is mobility as a service. So if we, if we get back to that idea of the, uh, service on demand, the sort of holy grail is how you synchronize all of these different modes of transportation. So you've got shared cars that are autonomous and going around. Some of those will be robot taxis in a, an Uber type environment where you can order them to come to your house and possibly you share them. And then those connect with robo buses or shuttles or they take you directly to the metro. How you coordinate all of that, if you look up to the top right, that's where they think the money is. And I talked to um, one of the, an executive from one of the larger um, auto manufacturers, and they said, in 20 years, you may not even know us uh, as the family name of cars anymore. What we really want to do is we want to be that mobility as a service owner, because that's where the money is, because you have all of the retail side and the payment for the services which go around it. And you can see that in both of those graphs there. 
And again, it's really hitting at about 20, 25 through 2030. And so that's the sort of thing we're looking about. You've got a swarm of AVs going around as either robo taxis or shuttles. You've got individual owners. Um, and when they're not using them, they're renting them out so that they can go around. And all of this can be used as feeders to the public transit system. I, I won't spend too much time because we're at uh, a quarter till, but on the technologies. The car technologies, I guess most people know about. They're sort of the advanced driver systems, but there's also the safety and security side of things. So the cybersecurity side to make certain that they don't um, tamper with your car. And then the also huge amount of money is the infotainment and the navigation side. If you think about it, and this is quite important, it is not what's in the vehicle in the future. It is how the vehicle contacts the rest of the world. And so it's V to V, which is vehicle to vehicle, V to P, which is pedestrian, V to N, which is the network, V to I, which is essentially everything else. And so if you think about it, most of, of what's going to be collecting, most of the sensors and the collection of data actually will be dependent upon that infrastructure. So other vehicles, infrastructure, the network, and pedestrians. And um, there's an ongoing debate, which I won't get into today, but it's very important. If you think about the hardware and software, if all of this data is being driven, and computerization is being driven out of the car, it's going to have to reside in the infrastructure, and that means connectivity. And so you're looking at either what they call the SRC, which is, is a sort of wireless operation that they, they're using right now in many towns and cities. Uh, it's relatively fast, but it, it doesn't go a long distance, so you have to have quite a few of them. Uh, 5G, when it comes, and it will come, and the Chinese are already testing it in test beds, and we're getting test beds here as well. Potentially, it's much faster, um, with more carries more data. It just doesn't exist yet. But all of these things, including that type of decision, are going to have to be looked at quite quickly because you as municipalities will have some control and say over what sort of roadside units they have, where they're going to put them on their signs, the cameras, the lane markers, the traffic lights, the parking meters. All of those things should be under your control, at least as planning and zoning. And the other important aspect is almost well, all of these autonomous cars will be electric. And, and that's almost the most revolutionary thing about all of this is that they're talking about a redesign, a complete redesign of the internal combustion engine. And that's partly because it's a lower cost. And if you had to go back and design a car again, you wouldn't design it like this. You wouldn't design an engine like this and you wouldn't be dependent upon oil. Um, and that's also because uh, you're essentially running a motor rather than an engine. So you only have about 20 moving parts in an, an electric uh, AV, whereas you'd have about 2,000 parts in our normal cars. But it's also because you need a lot of electricity for the cameras and the sensing, the mapping, and the guidance systems. And that's best generated by making it an electric car that has a lot of electricity available and is using it in the proper way. There's also the climate change side of things and all other sorts of issues around that. And so what you see is China and Europe moving very rapidly to requiring. So they're banning diesel and they're banning uh, normal fuel cars. And so and they're giving great incentives for electric cars. And every day we hear where the large auto manufacturers have decided that they're going to, to shift entirely to electric cars. And part of that is the autonomous cars because autonomous vehicles will run much better once they are. And if again, if you look up at that graph, it's about 2030 where you see that sort of tipping point at 50 or 60 percent, where you're moving entirely away from the, uh, the gas-driven car. And of course, through all of that, you've got your data, uh, data where you're driving, um, how you're driving, all of that can be collected and monetized. Some of it is proprietary to, proprietary to the companies, some of it should be shared with government and the public, and that's something that, as municipalities, we need to decide. So that's the sort of thing, because also it's, it's right in the middle of the smart cities movement, and transportation's right in the middle of that, but it's all about connectivity and the same things that we're talking about, from smart signs and intersections 
to large file transmissions and two-way streaming. All of these things have to be thought about um, and planned for uh, fairly rapidly. So that's what we have. We have this sort of race to build and own all of those things, but most of the companies, if you see these four particularly, you've got Ford aligning with the Alibaba group, trying to come up with a transportation mobility cloud. And they're one of the groups who say, you may not recognize us as an auto manufacturer in that many years because this is what we want. We want this entire cloud and all that, that falls under it. And so you see different groups already um, forming around this transportation mobility cloud. And again, if you look at the global revenues, that's because that's where they're going to be making their money, not just producing and selling individual cars. So here's what it's supposed to, I would say it's not 2020, I'd say it's 2030 vision. But all of this depends on connectivity and fiber. And that's why we have to make certain that we can uh, get fiber out to the rural communities and counties and smaller towns or else they get essentially excluded from a lot of this. So when we're talking about the AV economy, we're not talking about Bob's new Tesla, we're talking about all of these companies wanting to do all of these things, and it's essentially inevitable. The good news is that, I mean, the studies show that in terms of safety, it's enormously important. Um, there are a lot of other good things in terms of climate change and the shift toward electrification. People aren't quite sure what happens with congestion and travel time. The bad news is that for towns and cities, you are probably going to face reduced revenues. You probably read about this sort of thing because there are, you won't have the traffic fines and all of the taxes associated with automobiles will be uh, probably reduced or eliminated. If you think about parking and the DMV and the fines and DWIs and gas tax as that works in at the state and the local level, all your parking infrastructure may want to change if they're continually moving about and you have to have places where they are maintained. These are autonomous cars driving about or something. Um, it probably will have some effect on public transit and that's something you need to plan for. 70% of police departments work on traffic management and you get a lot of revenue in that area and that will be changed enormously. And again, nobody really knows what about will happen with congestion. More broadly, it's going to be restructuring of the workforce, which again, you've probably read about, um, because it affects, if you start thinking your way through it, it affects a lot of people and a lot of groups. Um, if nothing else, if you look at the map on the left, back in 2014, I suspect it's about the same right now, uh, truck driving, and by that I suspect they mean drivers of all sorts, um, was the most common job in a multitude of states. Um, and if you think of everything from van drivers to taxis to bus drivers, there's a lot of people involved with that. And if it, if 15 years from now it has moved toward more than 50% being autonomous, that's going to have a huge impact on local economies. So. Let's look at the policy implications and the infrastructure implications at a, at a lower level, so at our municipality levels. The policy implications, mm, uh, reduced revenues, and also extra expenditures, because you're going to have to put in a lot of, uh, of the technology that is necessary, or at least be part of that technology that is necessary for the infrastructure side of things. And if it moves toward a payment platform, you're going to have to be able to coordinate some of this um, because towns and cities want to be able to actually benefit from this. Uh, there's the whole data collection and privacy side of things. Um, need to think that through. It will be a different set of people, I suspect, who will do that in terms of managing the data, but also negotiating for what data policies you should have. They also have to be looking at open technologies because we're not really there with knowing where all of this goes at this point. Um, obviously, the codes, the permissions, the zonings for all of these things, if you're going to change it and have dedicated uh, AV lanes and things like that. I mean, curb policy is enormous uh, because uh, you can't have double parking as AVs are pulling over to let people out in the middle of the road. It blocks up all traffic. 
traffic. And so you have to think through what is the curb policy, and that'll be infrastructure changes as well. Um, and you have to coordinate that with other, other agencies. And of course, right now, most of our procurement is pretty slow stuff and not really worked, uh, set up for this type of, of, of purchasing. Um, and then really, as we've seen early on, if Way or um, Uber decides that they're going to drop 500 cars on your town and they're going to pick up all the data as they did in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh didn't really even negotiate the data privacy policy with them, then Uber keeps all the data. And a lot of this data is stuff that you need for the safety of pedestrians and others. Um, so it's all of those types of policies that we now need to start looking at. And then, of course, integrally related to that is the infrastructure implications because you may want to have pedestrian zones or dedicated segregation of AV lanes from non-autonomous lanes. All of the infrastructure in terms of the sensors on the poles and lights and the intersections, that will probably be provided privately, but you've got to work up some sort of relationship and control and oversight over that. Uh, road markings and signals and signs and maintenance become much more important and therefore require greater expenditure. Um, and again, that curb and access drop off and pick up is something you don't think about, but in fact, it's going to become an enormous problem. Um, electrical recharging, because they're all going to need to tie into the grid. And I can't stress it enough, it's that connectivity. We need fiber in rural areas and we need them in our smaller towns because if not, and, and because we know it's going to grow exponentially with this, but also because we simply don't have it right now, even for our sort of internet side of things. Um, and then of course there's the reuse of parking spaces because I know I was in Kansas City and about a third of Kansas City is already uh, parking. And, and of course these are all the stakeholders you need to be looking at, um, essentially everybody will want to know about this. Um, and public acceptance is going to be quite an important thing. So I'll, I'll stop there and just see if there are any other questions um, on this. Um, maybe I can answer one or two. But if if Virginia wants to do something with a, I mean, this is obviously getting way too compact. Uh, but if we wanted to do a, a, a seminar where we worked our way through and looked at, at what individual uh, regions or counties in Virginia want to need to know about this it might be worth thinking about organizing some of those if you want to give me um send me an email and we can talk about that thanks dale well, Sarah. um thank you for sharing your contact info there and just so everyone knows we'll send this out in a follow-up email as well i do have a couple of questions here if you're ready dale sure okay um this is from richard rednicki says, um, you said the cost of AVs is going to be prohibitive to individuals initially, but then say robotic driving will take over by 2030. This seems like a very short time frame for a large price drop and replacement of the majority of all the pools of vehicles in the country. Can you elaborate on how that happens? Well, I'm not exactly sure how it, it's going to happen. I think they don't know. I certainly don't know. I think they're, they're sort of they're sort of hedging their bets. If there is, if people are broadly accepting of this type of technology and they can sell sort of level four cars and people want to have the capability to do both, they can probably pare down the cost of that sort of thing. So it doesn't always have to be a luxury model or a Tesla. Um, and if they can, I'm sure they'll sell as many as they possibly can. Um, it's just that my impression is right now they're a bit skeptical because they're throwing this on the global public almost unprepared. You know, they're, they're sort of depending in a way on the press to, to sort of make people receptive to this. And um, not all of the, uh, the, um, the uh, surveys that they've done have come back all that positive. A lot of people not too sure about this sort of technology. So the question is, do they want to bet the farm on people owning it individually, or do they want to hedge their bets because they can see they can make a huge amount more money if they have ownership in the continuing aftermarket process and mobility web. And so I think that's where they're, they're also putting it. Uh, I don't think it's one or the other, and I don't know when it changes. 
Um, but I suspect at some point, you know, in 2040, it will all be autonomous or probably all. Okay. And before I get to the next one, I see a couple of people have their hands raised. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in the questions box and we will get through all of them before we get off here as long as Dale has time. Um, Richard has another question. What happens if people just don't want AV? Some people enjoy classic cars and driving. Do you foresee government regulation which prevents people from driving? Well, very interesting question, and I and I think this is why um, they're, they're, the industry is in a bit of flux right now because technologically they already can put AVs on the road. They're, they're still learning in the sense that the more they drive, the more miles they get, the safer they become. But you know, a lot of people like driving cars, and so then the question is for municipalities and other areas what because I suspect it will all fall down to the governance at a local level. Do you want to have dedicated areas or dedicated lanes that just go to AV and then everybody else just drives as normal? Uh, there are problems with that and you have to think that through. But I think everyone's wondering at this point, you know, what will be the sort of public acceptance of that? Because, you know, if you, part of it is demographic, um, as you get older, you don't necessarily want to drive as much, and there's the disability side of things, um, as well as the fact that the younger tend, um, by survey, not to actually care about driving as much. And you know, we probably have read about they're not getting their driver's licenses at nearly the levels that we oldies did. Um, and so the question is, how is the public going to receive this? And at a local level, you know, it may be almost sort of local plebiscites that say we're we're going to reserve this area, or we, you know, you might try and make it an AV excluded zone. Uh, we'll just have to see. Okay, thanks. And next question is from Debarga Singh Gupta. Really curious about signage not just on municipal areas, but inside private property, like campuses, et cetera. How do you reconcile signage for AVs and others? Well, yes, it's, it's very important because it's going to, at least in the interim, it's also going to have to be good signage for your normal driving. Um, I mean, the, the signs don't really, the autonomous vehicles don't need to look at signs. Uh, so all they need is a sensor. Um, and so, then the question also is who's responsible for the sensor and uh, or the sign itself where it's placed obviously it's got to be the municipality but they're probably not going to want to maintain those sensors um, and so that means some sort of public private relationship um, for a huge amount of signage um, and as it moves more and more into the technology I suspect what they'll have is the sort of cat's eyes in the middle between lanes, which prohibit cars from shifting lanes and all types of things. And again, you're in the situation where all of that infrastructure has to be supervised. There has to be an oversight over it. And I can't see that that's anybody's responsibility but the municipalities. But on the other hand, they're probably not going to want to own it and probably not necessarily maintain it, although that may become part of their expenditure where their maintenance crew actually has to do that. Um, so those are the sorts of things that need to be at least thought of um, as, yeah, as the signage side of things and the poles and where they can put the equipment, um, you know, if they can drop it, um, if, they, can, if they, they make your whole town look aesthetically horrible because you've got the, uh, stuff hanging off of your poles, all of those things are both at a state and a local level in terms of governance. And I suspect there'll be huge numbers of court fights about all of that. Thanks, Dale. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next question is from Shana Schaefer asking, um, Northern Virginia Transportation Authority is already looking at developing technologies. What is the balance among state, regional, and local groups for policy development and regulation? Are state or federal mandates likely? Well, it's interesting because the APA, and many of you probably attended it, um, uh, met in Washington about four Sundays ago, well, for a couple of days, um, 
to look at, at different policy issues. Um, my impression is the Feds in America, which is a bit different from some of the European and you know, city states like Singapore, but in America, I get the sense the federal government will only sort of have very broad guidelines about safety, and uh, they will probably relegate all of the usage and testing, as they seem to have already, to the state level. And so the states will decide who can drive what, when. So in California, I think they're now testing uh, AVs driverless. Um, and where that is done probably comes down to the city because if the city or the county says, well, not, not in my backyard, you're not driving driverless yet, um, then it doesn't happen. So it is this sort of, and, and then of course the money is coming from the top mostly, although it may be that the independently, uh, the revenues will come increasingly from county and local level I don't know. In in some ways, it it, it reflects the, the problems that we had with the high-speed broadband, where nobody really knows, you know, there's somebody giving you money, so they have some control over it. But on the, on the other hand, you want to have individual control over your signage and your own pedestrian zones and all of the planning aspects. And so um, I suspect what we'll see is broad guidelines by the state, which may vary. And that's a whole other problem because if you have interstate commerce, then you'll have lawsuits about, you know, if you can't drive your AV over the state line, I don't know, maybe that becomes an issue. Um, but you also have a lot of state roads and national roads. And I, as those move toward autonomy, where, where people have to decide, you know, particularly with trucks and such, I suspect you'll have to have some group at the federal level step in. So I think it's, it's a problem. And I don't think anybody knows at this point. Okay. Do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Okay. Um, the next one, please excuse me for this pronunciation. Bihu Shu asks or says, I think 5G, not fiber, will be the impetus for connected vehicles, IoT, I think that's an abbreviation, et cetera. I suspect you're right. Uh, ultimately, I don't see how it won't go to 5G because 5G is going to play such a, a large role in telecommunications as well. So as you say, the IoT and, and so many other aspects of the connected digital world are going to keep progressing. And of course, it's not going to stop at 5G. There'll be a 6G um, long after I'm dead. And it's those types of things that are continually moving forward. I don't... Um, don't imagine they're going to stay with a, a local wireless. That may be that they get some sort of combination that work together better. Right now, um, well, in the time, just this last year, I've, I've heard uh, in conferences, one group will get up and say, it's absolutely absurd. Of course, we, we can't bet on 5G. It might be decades away. And then the next group will get up and say, that's crazy. We're testing it right now. You'd be crazy to stay with the SRC. Um, why don't we all just start planning on 5G? And I suspect it'll be resolved in the next two or three years. But I think you're right. I think it's got to go to 5G. What it probably takes is one of the large or one of the large uh, coalitions to say this is this is where we're going with it. And I think we've already I think we've already seen that. I, I won't name them because I'm not absolutely sure about which group have already said that they're signing up for the 5G side of things. But I think a lot of the, the big coalitions are already planning on that. All right, next question is from Omar Masri asking how many states have passed bills preempting local regulation of AVs in terms of data slash operations. It seems at the local level, they'll only be left to focus on platooning locations but have no control over AVs just circling a neighborhood if there are no parking spaces available. Yeah, yeah. It. Uh, I was looking at it the other day. I should have put a map up of it. It's changing somewhat, but it's about half. The, I thought it was about 21 that it still have prohibitions. It's an interesting thing because it sort of mirrors. You remember on the uh, the rural or on the broadband side of things for municipal broadband, there were a number of states who put encumbrances on um, individual towns and municipalities from from developing their own 
broadband policies or broadband infrastructure, um, if it competed in some way against the, the commercial groups, the, the telecoms groups. And some states went for that and others said, well, that's crazy. We'll never get it um, to the rural areas if we don't allow that. And um, I think what it is right now, people don't appreciate how big a transition this is economically. And that as it becomes more aware, I mean, we're not, all we do is, you know, the, politically right now, it's not the thing that people are talking about. If you look at your, any normal newspaper, you may not, you may go a week without seeing anything about autonomous vehicles. But at some point, once it's recognized that sort of magnitude of what's going to happen here, I suspect then all the politics start jumping in at every different level. All right. And then the very last question we have from Jeffrey Harvey says, given that most roads and road right of way in Virginia are maintained and operated by VDOT, do you see this as an advantage or disadvantage for deploying roadside AV technology? Yes, that's interesting um, because, I mean, in many ways, it, it, when I used to live up in Connecticut and um, nobody even knew what county you were in because all you did was think in terms of your borough or your township and or your city and they were the ones who had the political control and the revenue control and, and they could make all of the decisions um here state you know there's state roads um and the counties have a lot more political authority whereas uh, the cities often less so or at least the small towns and um so yeah, it, it depends on each different state. In um, Virginia, I know McAuliffe administration, when they started that uh, autonomous center of, uh, system center of excellence, um, it sounded all pretty good. There hasn't been, to my knowledge, a huge amount done, um, but it, given you know, that the testing is going on, but you know, it's not the promotion sort of things. I think um, uh, Swanka Burnett and others, he's, in charge of the transportation side of things up in Loudoun have been looking at this sort of thing because you sort of wonder, do you do it on a county basis or do you start trying to coordinate on state roads? Um, and sometimes, particularly up here in Loudoun, you'll even have individual developments that are essentially retaining the power of a city themselves. So they could put in any infrastructure they wanted if it's an individual development like Loudoun One. Um, and so it, it is going to, to vary. I mean, they have made a lot of good noises in Virginia. Um, it's just that, uh, I don't know, I haven't seen the state do a lot um, in the last year at least. But maybe I'm wrong on that. All righty, well that is it for questions. Dale, thank you so much. Do you have any last words or anything to add or anything you think people missed as far as questions? Well, only to say sorry that it, I had to cram so much into, I thought maybe that would help with the perspective, but what I've taken is essentially a, a six hour day and crammed it into a 60 minutes. So um, if if you're interested in looking at it broader, give me a call or, or email and, and we can think about it. Because I think it'd be sort of interesting to have Virginia do one or two seminars, you know, in different areas and start looking at the regional impact of all of this. Partly it helps to get um, other elected officials on board because it's very difficult to get good perspective or education these days. That's what all the planners are complaining about. And, you know, it's no good to be a planner sent up by the mayor or the supervisors and told to go to one of these commercial conferences and then come back and tell them what they should do about the AV economy. Uh, that's just deadly. And so what you really need to do is get everybody on the board or the council or the mayor to understand what's going on. And maybe that, that helps to do it in a single day where they actually come and listen to it. That's the idea anyway. Um, well, thank you so much for doing this presentation with us today. I know I enjoyed tuning in and hopefully it helped to break up everyone's day coming out of that holiday weekend. Um, again, be on the lookout for the follow-up email. It will have CM information, contact information for Dale, and how to sign up for December's webinar. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Sarah.